My name is James O'Keefe. I'm captain of the Massachusetts Pirate Party. Um, I'm joined today by uh, <clears throat> First Officer Steve and our 17th Middlesex candidate for state representative, uh, Joe. How are the two of you? Doing well, Jamie. You know, I'm living the dream as best I can. Just kind of going for it. Well, I'm just happy I'm just staying cool, but you know, the, the rain the next week will be lovely. Um, although my raspberries would have appreciated it if it came, you know, a couple weeks ago. But with that, um, so uh, before we get into the three segments that we're going to discuss, uh, just some housekeeping. Uh, we are planning to be at the Worcester Pride Parade uh, on September 7th. Sorry, Worcester, Worcester Pride Festival. Sorry. We'll have a table there um, and we will, uh, that'll be September 7th. And we'll have a link in the description if you want to join us and help uh, our tabling opportunity. I tell people how to protect their privacy and about the pirate party and all that. And uh, on October 19th and 20th, uh, we should have a table at the Boston Anarchist Book Fair. Uh, which will be in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And if, again, you'd like to help us with that, uh, there'll be a link to a sign-up form where you can do that. Uh, so those are the activities that we have planned for now. Of course, Joe is running for uh, state representative, and if you'd like to help with his campaign, you can check him, check out the his website at honoroski.org and We'll link below for that as well. Um, and with that, uh, how are the two of you? I already uh, asked that, didn't I? <laughs> you did. Uh, just going in quickly about the whole campaign thing, too. Sure. Um, I know I need to update that website um, because I haven't updated it since I went there. But there are links. And you can reach me right now if you want to reach me you could easily just message into the mass pirates. So that way, um, in case I get distracted as I do sometimes, Jamie could be like Joe or any other, the number of people that are marring that email. Um, we're always looking for help as well in the Massachusetts chapter. And there's links to our efforts on the national level. There are links to our efforts on the international level. So you can choose your own level of involvement, but I would love help at any level, whether it be locally here in Lowell, in Arlington, in Somerville, wherever you find yourself, there are different ways that you can help. And even if it's just one toe in there, uh, every little bit of effort is appreciated. Uh, so. One thing I'll say, Joe, is we can always create Honoroski or Joe Honoroski at, or Joseph Honoroski at massparts.org and have that redirect to the email of your choice. Yeah, that works too. Okay. Um, well, you get something again, else for your campaign. Yeah. Again, it's it's one of those things that no matter where people want to help out, like if say you're like, hey, I don't like that guy, Joe, but I love the pirates. Um, you know, wherever you're helping out, it is appreciated. So, you know, just saying. Cool. So our first segment, uh, Steve, there's some news out of San Francisco. Ah, let's unmute the microphone. New <laughs> San Francisco. Oh, uh, yeah. It's, you know, it's one of the, this is one of those catch 22s about summer because, you know, when you're recording, you want to try to keep your mic off so there, you know, you don't hear the fan or the air conditioning going. And the fan or the air conditioning is going because it's, it's fuggy today. Yeah. Fuggy, fuggy, fuggy. It's, muggy <laughs> fuggy <laughs> at any rate um so yeah this is um this is sort of one of the one of the interesting you know uses of computers and big data is that they can solve complex problems and you know the people and you know you could give it some information the computer spits out an answer and maybe the end user who get has to deal with that answer doesn't really understand where it came from um you know algorithmic this that and the other thing and you know there's you know, a general you know, there's, there's a general lack of transparency you know general gripe but 
for San Francisco, there, you know, this is something specific and the, the, you know, the city supervisors are actually taking action on it. So there are a couple of um, companies, uh, the examples, uh, two, two examples of which are RealPage and Yardi. So these are companies that are used by corporate landlords to help them set rent prices. So basically a, a landlord that uses one of these services, they provide the service with some information about, you know, how much you're charging and the apartments are renting. And, you know, the, you know, algorithmically, these companies collect all this data from different landlords and different properties. And then they rec make recommendations on what uh, the rent should be set to or what the landlord should be able to charge in a given market. Um, the idea is to, for the I general idea is to help the landlord maximize uh, the amount of rent that they're taking in. Now, ordinarily, if a bunch of, uh, you know, if a bunch of corporate landlords got together and decided to do price fixing, this would be collusion. This would be antitrust. This would be a no-no. Um, and the San, the San Francisco Board of Supervisors is sort of taking the position that, yeah, if a third party algorithm does the equivalent thing, um, you know, then this is also a no-no. It looks from the article I read, it looks like they have not voted on it, but this will be coming up for a hearing soon. Um, I do have to say, you know, kudos to the uh, Board of Supervisors for, you know, taking a step against sort of a, an anti-competitive kind of thing and, you know, trying to uh, avoid having the, you know, renter population of San Francisco, you know, to reduce the amount that they're getting gouged. Uh, of course, one of the reasons that renters in San Francisco get gouged is because the city, like a lot of metropolitan areas, hasn't built enough housing over the last couple of decades. So um, if you could, guys, San Francisco boards of supervisors, if you could fix that too, that would be even better. <laughs> Thoughts, gentlemen? I feel like this is something the FTC should get involved in, right? Mm -hmm. Or they should be like, Justice Orange should do an antitrust complaint and be like, yeah, no, you can't have two different companies going and aggregating all of these different landlords together in order to maximize their revenue. Like, that's not a perfectly competitive market, right? Perfectly competitive market is you know, all of the landlords are uh, not price makers, but price takers, right? So they shouldn't be able to set the prices that way. Right. And I mean, for a lot to a certain extent, you know, this data, you know, the prices that for a new rental um, might be public, you know, because you're advertising it. But, you know, for your existing tenants, well, that's that's you know, it's not public information. So they're using effectively, <laughs> you know, they're effectively using their, you know, non non-public data uh, that isn't available to, you know, other landlords or landlords who don't use this system and, you know, using it to their own advantage. BlackRock Capital has entered the chat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you know, you know why venture capitalists and you know the big uh, in, institutional investors are investing in housing because they can make a frick ton of money from it. <laughs> and you know, this is it's sort of like the you know the idea that you know your home is an investment and it's to build wealth. Well, it you know it could build institutional wealth too. It depends on you know who's buying. You know who's against rents, rents and rent seeking? Adam Ooh. Smith. <laughs> but you know, modern modern capitalists are all 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 in on the rent seeking thing. The rents are better whether they're copyrights or property or or rights enshrined by government power. Um, so, uh, Joe, you had an update from Massachusetts about some stuff that we've seen in terms of more transparency for police and i yeah, don't mean, so I don't mean transparency means, like we're more transparent to the police i mean they're more transparent to us so this is actually an investigation that was done by uh cbs and wbz and they really looked into the officer database for crime statistics and you know 
bless those news institutions because they are part of the machine, but they have enough free autonomy that they actually uncovered that 46 different officers, they started down the rabbit hole realizing that there was one officer in Salem that was just horrendous. And it kind of led down the rabbit hole to realize that there was 47 officers that were instructors. Now, mind you, in order to be an instructor, you have to have a perfect record. You can't be demoted. You can't, like, all these things. You can't have misdemeanors. You can't be beating people up. You can't, like, you have to be, like, the the good cop, the, the one that actually does their job right, and that way you can teach others, right? Well, they found a whole host of people who should not be instructors who were instructors, about 46 souls, in fact. Now, mind you, there's still, like, over 2,000 instructors, so this is by far not the majority, but the fact that there was so many instructors that had some type of criminal record, drug abuse, alcohol, being drunk on the job, uh, assault and battery, you name it, if there was an offense, they probably had it on there, that they got a slap on the hand because of it being a good old boys club. And so, you know, this article, we'll, we'll definitely link the article. Um, but just a lot of more misconduct and stuff that should just be in the public eye. And so this is one of those things where, um, they are responsible for training officers to do the right thing. And if they're not doing the right thing to start with, why should these people be training the, the future officers? You know, they're not going to train them right. They're going to train them. And, you know, I, I get that we all can make a mistake, but making a mistake and then going and being the person who said, oh, I never made a mistake, like people lying on their time cards to get more money to get overtime. I kind of heard that one before on the state level with state officers, you know, so it yeah. seems like that that trick is not limited to just the state officers. No, I, I agree that uh, falsifying a time card for is to essentially commit wage theft or wage fraud, whichever way you want to, however way you want to look at it. I'm not a lawyer, so I can't give you a great, uh, a precise classification, but it's it's kind of bollocks. <laughs> it's crap. <laughs> shouldn't do that, especially if you're a police officer. You shouldn't do that. So, so long story. Long story short, what's going on is that, you know, a major news agency like WBC and CBS by default did a fairly thorough investigation to Massachusetts instructors and kind of found a rabbit hole of officers committing crimes using their own database to find all this information. And I find it just absolutely hilarious that you know, in their own database, they have officers that have committed crimes, and yet they're still officers. So, yeah, when we were discussing which topics um, to talk to uh, to to bring up today, uh, we when Joe suggested this this uh, WBZ uh, report. Um, we went looking for the officer disciplinary records database and we'll put a link in the description. If you want to go look, I mean, apparently you can look up records by last name, law enforcement agency, you can get them in, uh, you know, comma delimited file format. If you so inquire, <laughs> if you so wish. So, you know, and this is updated on the 23rd of July. So, you know, it's, it's open information as it should be as we pirate support and uh, by all means, we should go in and take advantage of that. Uh, Steve, you had an update for us about a particular uh, MBTA station that I, I know you and I know rather well. Oh, of course. Um, so a little bit of background on the T. So the T has been in sort of, you know, financial turmoil, <laughs> for lack of a better word. I think turmoil is a fair word 
for quite a few years. And basically, you know, once upon a time, uh, our state government made the decision that a percentage of sales tax revenues would be what funds the T. And, you know, this turned out not to be enough to meet their operating and maintenance costs. So we've had lots of, you know, years of deferred maintenance. We've had an orange line train catching on fire. We've had slow zones and, you know, all the things, none of, none of these things are, um, you know, the, the hallmark of a, uh, a well-functioning or, or a well-resourced transit system. And I, sh I, 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 sh I, I, I want to take back well-functioning because I think, you know, I, I do give the folks at the T credit for trying to make lemons out of lemonade, but, you know, ultimately they're still, wor they're still just working with lemons. So we have the Elwife T station. This was uh, part of the red line extension that was done in the 70s and 80s. The station was built in 1985. Uh, it's the terminus of the red line in Cambridge. And it's got a it's got a big it's got a big parking garage, something like twenty seven hundred spaces, and the parking garage is showing its age. It's got some structural problems. Uh, there are parts of it that I believe are closed off. One entrance in particular is you know you can't use anymore because, well, I presume it's structure. It, it presume there are structural issues, but the garage has got problems and you know and it's one of those cases of you either got to deal with it or you know eventually you just or band-aid it or eventually just you know sort of phase out the use of it uh the umass boston parking garage kind of comes to mind um <laughs> which you know well yeah you can't yeah it's got a big parking garage under the campus yeah you can't park there <laughs> just like it's not gonna hold up so the T is looking at, you know, replace the possibility of replace having to replace a garage. So replacing the garage would cost about one hundred fifty five million dollars. Um, my, you know, belief that since the T doesn't have enough money to fund the expenses it has, throwing another one hundred fifty five million dollar expense at it is probably not going to help. So I'm assuming they don't have that money. The T also estimates that just to keep the garage functioning at its present level will require something like $55 million of maintenance expenses over the next 10 years. Um, again, you know, if the, if they're, you know, they have a maintenance backlog and the legislature is not willing to cover it. Well, this is just going to be, you know, a further maintenance backlog, you know, and they're pretty forthright upfront about saying that, you know, at this particular station, the ratio of uh, revenue revenue to maintenance costs has just become untenable. You know, the, the T is this is also the station where you know a lot of suburbanites will come in, people who don't have access to the train, but you know they drive in from out of town, they park it, they park at the T station, they take the T in and take the T out. So it's it is actually a, a fairly important congestion reliever, uh, probably on the order of thousands of vehicle trips trips a day. So if you're the T, what do you do in this sort of situation? Well, the uh, this is, you know, Cambridge real estate is really valuable. Uh, the MBTA has, I think, something like 15-ish acres where the station sits and an adjacent, you know, 20 acres that's currently used for commuter rail maintenance operations, but can be moved, you know, someplace else. So what they're trying to do is, you know, basically submit, they're trying to find um, a developer to work with. And the gist is, you know, you rebuild the train station, you do some development in the area around it, and we'll lease you the air rights for, you know, however many years. So it, it's basically trying to use a public, pro public private partnership to sort of solve some of their maintenance challenges, which this is good. This is, this is creative. Um, and, you know, it's a, it's a creative solution. It's also probably, you know, it could potentially further some of Cambridge's goals in terms of, you know, their master plan for the Elwife district. Uh, but most importantly, it would keep an important transit resource running. <laughs> I don't know. I'm, this is, you know, they, this is just get in the getting started process. And, you know, the T later this month, will start talking to interested people and hopefully, you know, they hope to 
have a direction sort of by the end of the year. Uh, this could be really, um, you know, it's one of those things that could work out one of two ways. Uh, it could be a really transformative good thing for the area or, you know, with construction and labor costs, maybe they don't get any takers and, you know, the garage just continues to, <laughs> you know, to, to sit there and crack. But, you know, it is, it is, uh, it is a big piece of news, at least uh, in my neck of the woods, because, you know, I'm like about a 30 minute walk from, from the station and I occasionally, you know, we'll go use there to take the tea. I, I will walk there to take the tea or to take shuttle buses that uh, depart from there. So any gentlemen, any just thoughts on funding the tea? <laughs> so it seems like they're completely out of money and they're looking for outside development. Uh, knowing some of the bigger developers, um, there are developers out there that if it is advantageous for them, especially who work in the Boston area, um, they might be all over that. So I, it's so, this might actually happen. Um, it depends on how lucrative it is for those developers, but you know, when it's going to public auction, well, they're not auctioning this, the property. I think there are the, as Steve no. said, there are auctioning the air rights or maybe they'll auction the air rights. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there is. A, we'll we'll have a link to one of the to the uh, MBTAs. They call it a notice of intent, um, but basically it's the T at Bastot saying that hey, this is what we're trying to do, and here's a little schedule. And uh, if you're interested, here's who to contact. I mean, I could see all sorts of bigger corporations that do it, like Form Up or Diaz or any of the other really big names in construction who regularly do massive projects, I'm sure that they're going to have people bidding on it, you know, and hopefully it works out and hopefully whoever company gets it, um, one, one will get their name behind it. I mean, I know Callahan's a huge construction company, mm -hmm. you know, and hopefully like somebody who cares about Boston and who like, it might be one of the best things that happened for a while. So that's yeah. actually really good news. Yeah, I mean our D our state DOT is um where some state DOTs are strictly focused on interstate, interstate, interstates, <coughs> Texas. Um <laughs> how do you fix a congested 10 lane highway? You make 20, and when that 20 is get <laughs> is congested, <laughs> well, we of course we you know go bigger. You're not you know. There's well, well, sorry, go ahead, Steve. But I mean, our DOT, um, at least in their, you know, they just released a, sort of a long term plan. This is sort of like a 15 year kind of thing, 10 or 15 year kind of thing. But they're pretty comprehensive in, you know, you know, there are, you know, automobiles are a necessity in a lot of places, but they're also, you know, really focused on things like, um, you know, closing gaps in sidewalks and, you know, making sure that regional transit authorities like, you know, ones in Lowell or Cape Cod or Worcester have enough money to operate. Um, so, but, you know, a lot of it depends. They have some great ideas, but it really is going to come down to will the legislature fund them? And, um, you know, will the legislature basically, you know, find, yeah, will, will it find a way to, to pay for this stuff or, you know, if you can't afford to drive, if you can't afford the vehicle tax, which is you know, on the order of thousands of dollars a year in this area, um, you know, you're, you're stuck on public transit and, you know, sometimes it's some of our, some of our transit systems have a bit to be desired. I mean, I could see it as a possibility of unlaying plans where they build a whole nother like shopping center or and or per, like kind of like what they have with the prudential center where they have business offices and stuff right above the t um making it a, another major hub in boston's interconnective hub you know i mean there's a lot of potential that mm -hmm. could come out of this a lot of good that can come out of this you know so i mean that's that's really close to a couple major hotels with alewife and you know there's uh 
this could be a good opportunity for the right investor to come in, the right developer to come in to really make things happen. So I'm hopeful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you've got Route 2, you've got Route 16, uh, you've got the Minuteman bike trail, you've got the red line, you've got at least some commuter rail going by that doesn't have a station. Um, that could be a good transportation hub. You know, you come in, you want to either by commuter rail, you can hop on the red line or by, um, you know, or you could drop your car off and take a commuter rail straight into Boston or take the red line to Kendall or Harvard or wherever you're going. Um, I mean, and, and then to think of it as like, there has been a bunch of like the old um, uh, lanes, was it lanes and names? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that that was torn down, and then there used to be the old discotheque that that got to, the club that got torn down, and that was turned into two different sets of uh, apartment apartment buildings or condos or whatever they are. And then behind mm -hmm. it, you've got more stuff. Although, man, if there was ever you ever needed to escape that, I would not want. To. I want to be there, but then I guess escaping Boston is probably a fool's errand. But um, but still, it's you know there's there's a lot of there's a lot of housing there. There's a lot of transportation there. Um, there's the shopping two shopping malls on either side of Route Two. Um, you know you could pull it together into a nice integrated district uh, with lots of transportation, but it's going to take the city. It's going to take the MBTA. It's going to take uh, private capital uh, to come together and, and pull that together. And mostly it's going to take the neighbors. So, yeah. And I mean, one of the, one of the sort of risky things about El the, that area is it is prone to, you know, sea level rise and a big, you know, tornado hurricane coming in and whacking us sort of like Sandy did uh, mm -hmm. to Brooklyn some years ago. And I mean, Cambridge is well aware of like flooding risks and the need for mitigation. But in order to, to mitigate, you actually have to build stuff. You know, um, you actually have to if if this thing is too low and you would fix it by raising it up eight feet. Well, you you have to raise it up eight feet. <laughs> um, you know, there's you know, it, it doesn't there's there is the hard work of doing the heavy lift, so to speak. Well, I'm sure you'll keep your eye on it and keep us involved, informed about how that goes. Uh, again, we'll put links to the MBTA's document. Uh, if you find if you live in Cambridge, Arlington, Somerville, Belmont, other adjoining communities, by all means, keep us informed. If you find out anything at info at masspirates.org, you can find us at masspirates.org. Uh, if you found this uh, video useful, give us a comment. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, and so with that, uh, again, we've got two events coming up, one in September, one in um, <clears throat> tabling events, and the other in October. So if you'd like to help us out with that, that'd be great. Uh, we're planning uh, our activities through the rest of the year, as well as uh, into next year with uh, city and town elections. Uh, so with that, uh, thank, <clears throat> thank you, Joe. Thank you, Steve. And we shall now say goodbye.